I'm, I'm pretty close, though, anyways. I know the meaning of it. <laughs> How amiable are the tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. And that means friendly and sociable. And um, we're talking about the church of God here. You know, uh, when I was uh, talk, uh, praying and, and, and seeking God for what, I'm, uh, you know how you're supposed to minister and you're not for sure what God has given you. And so, and uh, number two, it says, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrows have found an house and the, sh and, and the shadow, shadow of nest for herself. Where she may lay her young, even thy altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in the, thy house. They will, still, they will be still praising thee. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee and whose heart are the ways of them. Who's passing through the valley of Baca, I think as well, make it well. And that means means valley of tears. The, the rain also filleth the pools. They go from the strength to strengthen. Every one of them in Zion appear before God. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold, our God, our shield, and look upon the face of thy anointing. For the day in thy court is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he behold uh, from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. And, um, uh, you know, the, it seems like the devil's fighting on, for some reason on this. And just uh, I, I'm just kind of tongue-tied, but I know God has a reason for everything. And, and uh, Brother Shannon, if you just pray over the, you know, it's God's word, and I know everything, whatever God has, but pray over that God will bless this. Father, we ask you right now, God, that you would just anoint the messenger today, Father, as she brings forth your word. Anoint her lips of clay today, Father, and anoint every heart and mind in this house. God, I pray your perfect will be done in this place right now, God. In your name, Jesus, God, you will be done, God. Yes, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 In 10, it says, for the day in the courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. wickedness. Right. And then I, God gave me this to go along with it. And it's uh, Psalms 12, 2 and 1. Wait, 122 and 1, sorry. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And uh, as I was uh, thinking about this, and, and, and God was just dealing with me that there are so many of us that have been sick and afflicted, and, and different things have come upon us, but if we could be in the house of the Lord, then you don't rather be outside with all the wicked things going on. That's the, where we get our strength. And uh, I seen this uh, as I was thinking about God what do I what do I say what do I do to to help someone and it was like I seen these these four walls standing up and each wall per, uh, represented a person and as you take away a person to hold these four walls then the walls get weaker and in the end you've got one holding up a wall and if they stand in the middle it's still going to be shaky and that's why God puts people into the church to be the ones to hold it up. You've got to have the four walls to hold your church up. Yeah. And that is the four people that God puts people to be uh, the, the um, I'm trying to think of uh, what it, yeah, the, the foundation and the, the pillars. The pillars of the church. Uh, my mom always said, you've got to be a pillar of the church. You've got to be.
be a pillar of the church. And so, you know, we can be the doorkeeper. And that is such a blessing to have somebody to be the doorkeeper. And it says in here, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. You know, some people don't realize that they come to church, they, they sit and, and, and they do nothing. They don't want to be the doorkeeper. They don't want to be the cleaner. They don't want to be the singer. They don't want to be the pastor. They don't want to be the teacher. They don't want to... And, and they narrow it down. They actually just don't want to be nothing. They don't want to be anything to hold up the church. But that's why we need the pillars. We need the pillars to stay because they're the ones that's going to be faithful. No matter what, they're going to try to be in the house of the Lord. You know, sometimes uh, I was thinking about Brother Shannon, you know, as he was saying that he was calling there, but yet he lifted up his head. And, and, he was, it, and, and to me, it felt so much that as he was, he was still trying to struggle to lift up his head. That's the way the pillars of the church are. No matter what is going on, they're going to try to be here. They're going to try their best to be the ones that, that hold up. Because if you take each and every one of these away, then you will have nothing. And the church will fall. But we got to have people that's going to be that's going to be there no matter what. That When wind or high waters comes, as they would always say. But, you know, I, I worry... Sometimes because uh, once in a while I get into that, well, I just think I'm going to stay home. But then I think, you know, what if I decide to stay home, and then what if you decide to stay home, and you decide to stay home, you decide to stay home, you decide to stay home, you and you guys decide, then there would be nobody here left. And, you know, what 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 would be here? Nothing. And so everybody was, uh, I, I used to hear a song, and Sister Perry probably remembers it years ago. It said something about, if everybody was like me in the house of God. And I was thinking, oh man, that's not good because there's a lot of us that, that we don't do nothing in church. So if everybody was like us, nobody would do nothing. You know, so you got to put yourself, if everybody was like me, then what would this church be? And that's where you get the question mark. If everybody was like me and you start thinking about, do I, am I the one that I'm not holding nothing up? I'm not doing nothing for God? Uh, will I not volunteer for anything? Will I not go pray for somebody? Uh, call somebody on the phone? If if I am like that, then what what is everybody else like? Mm -hmm. and, and you think, man, what a sad church if we had everybody just like the one that sits there and thinks everyone question himself today and say, if everybody was like me, what would the church become? And if you are doing good, and if you are, are, are got something that God has placed in your life to do, and you're doing it, then that is a calling. And, and God has placed us in each and every one. It's like, sister, she's, she uh, takes care of great in the door, brother, brother Mark. If, if we didn't have them, we would have nobody. So if everybody was like them, boy, we would have a church because everybody would be willing to greet everybody at the door. And, but not everybody wants to do that job. Every, you know, and, and it's just like the pastor. Nobody needs to do that job with the pastor. But yet some of us think we should. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's just that, you know, the pastor, that his job is to hold up us. And then we need to help hold him up. Because he's not the only one that has to go to pray. And he's not the only one that is, is the one that no matter what is going on, he has to be the one to pray. Oh, I'm not praying for the pastor because he's supposed to be praying for me. Well, if everybody was like you, then what would the church become? You know, and and as a, when I was uh, younger, I used to skip church all the time because I just didn't really want to be there. It just I'm, and my excuse was my mom made me go. Well, that wasn't really this. That was just an excuse to stay home. And my mom pushed me. Well, that was just another excuse to stay home. If you could think of any kind of excuse. Uh, the people across the that sits across me was looking at me funny. Well, that was just another excuse to stay home. A wear a chip on your shoulder and say nobody's speaking to you and not walk back into the church. There is always an excuse for something that we can make up. You know, just to fall back, to stay home, go to sleep, uh, go to the mall. You know, it's just that that old song. I know you know it. Excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. The devil will supply them if the church you stay away. And it talks about the, the young child, the whole family had to stay home to blow that kid, blow, yeah, that poor kid's nose. And talk about, 
But when the weather's just right, we find somebody somewhere else to go. And, and the winter, it's too cold. And, and always an excuse why not to be there. And you think about that and you're like, am I that person? Am I that person that's going to constantly find an excuse to stay home even if it ain't for real? If, if it's something I have to make up? And, you know, it, it's just like the, the young man that always called, you know, had a reason why he couldn't be at work. Always had a reason why he... This and that, and, and uh, his his grandma died, and, and you know it's like the boss telling him. He said, "Well, it, your grandma died. Do you you believe that that they come back from the dead?" And, and that guy goes, "No." And he's you religious? And he's like, "No." And he goes, "So you don't believe he in re reincarnation?" No. And he's like, "Well, I just seen your grandma at the ball the other day." <laughs> well, <laughs> that was an excuse for not being there because his grandma passed away, and here she was alive, and he just made it up. So, but you know, people just make up different things, and and I've heard people say, "Oh man, I just this and this is going on." My, I, I've even heard people say, "My kid was so sick that we couldn't get out of the house," and then. You see them at the mall or at the Walmart, and they're just running around. Their kids are running around. And you're like, okay, yeah, we got that one. <laughs> we'll mark that out. We ain't going to be just like you. <laughs> but, you know, people make excuses. The devil will give you excuses if you'll just listen to him. Oh, well, look, your nose is running. You might want to stay home. Uh, you know, and I understand when people are really sick. There's people that really get sick, and I understand that. And, uh... You know, but I always, my mom used to, I mean, she really bring us kids to church, and we was sick, she would lay us down on that bench, and Becky remembers, <laughs> she's like, I'll bring your kids to church, and they can sit right there, if God can't heal them, then you expect somebody else to be able to heal them, you know, and usually, most of the time, we ended up going home, feeling better, and running around the church or something, then end up getting a spanking for when you get home, so, you know, it just... There's different things that we just let the devil use us. We we just don't we don't mean to. We're, and and if the devil can take the pillars of the church and start pulling them and pulling them and making excuses for why they shouldn't be there, then it makes the church shaky. You know, but that is the way the devil is. If he can give you depression, uh, no bill, you know, all these bills and and no gas and and you know something that's always going on until you just. You're so stressed that that even God couldn't even talk to you if He wanted to because you've got so much stress there. And then church is sometimes the only place you can get relief. But yet people will stay home from the place that they can go. And that's where it says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, that so many people are not very glad when it's, oh, it's Sunday again. Oh, man. You know, and, and this is me. I mean, I used to do that. Mom would go, it's Sunday, it's Sunday, you need to come. To, okay, I'm sending the kids. Sunday, you need to come to church with them. And I said, Mom, I'm doing good. I'm sending the kids. And I always did. I've never missed sending my kids to Sunday school. And so, but to get myself there was totally different because I'm like, Mom, it's not Sunday again. Football is on. And yeah, and so I used to go down to Kevin's and him because he will never did like football or any kind of sport. So I'd go down there and I was like, it's Sunday, you know. And but you know, it's just you know things like that. The devil just tries to to get things. In, and if you're already discouraged, then the devil works on you more and more. I mean, if you are one that gets discouraged easy, then that is what the devil works on. He'll find something that discourages you that day. And and that's why I told Tim. I said, you know, Tim, it's Sunday. You're going to get a headache. I know you will because you always get a headache on Sunday. And he's like. Well, it's just a bad migraine, and I know he gets bad migraine. But the devil just pushes on him more than anything on a Sunday because he knows that if he makes it in here, the more and more he pushes in here, sooner or later God's going to heal him of that. Because I used to have migraines so bad when I was younger that I meant, well, just about four or five years ago, I used to have migraines from when I was younger, and, and I would just, I meant my head would hurt so bad that I'd start getting sick of my stomach, and I I had them so bad I would just throw up and, and I couldn't find a place to sleep and I'd lay down and make me sick. If I sat up too long, and make me sick. And, and I used to have them and God healed me from them because I just kept pushing on. I finally got to the point where I loved church more than anything else. I loved God more than anything else. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to have to take you 
finding your own, your own God. And that's why with me, you know, I had to find myself. And I, you know, when it comes to excuse, like, oh, Mom, you know, it's really Sunday. Can you, like, just have church at 11 instead of 10? And I'm at, I would say that to her. I really would. I was like, and, and or maybe let's just do the 2 o'clock and then I get, and then when she'd do that, I'd still miss it anyway. So, you know, it was just not in my heart to go. That's all it was, was an excuse. And, and then I'd say, Mom, it's too early in the morning. I stayed up too late. And, you know, just, I know I made her crazy. And so, but, it, well, you know, I had to just keep, keep pressing on. And when it got to where she went and passed on, and my sister passed on, and my dad wasn't there, and he passed on, well, my Aunt Ruby was an awesome, uh, you know, she would pray and stuff. But none of these people were here anymore. And so then when someone called, they'd say, hey, Sandra, can you pray? And I was thinking, hey, I'm not what I need to be to pray. And then it's like, well, your mom's gone. And, and I know that, you know, God uses people and, and, and uh, uh, hands down the torch to them. So, you know, would you pray? And I was thinking, they want me to pray for them. <laughs> they should be praying for me. And then I was like, okay. And then that was it. I was left it at that. And, and nothing, you know, they didn't get prayer. I don't know. I'm hoping somebody else was praying for them because I never did. I would say, okay, but I didn't mean I was going to really pray for them. I just, okay. You know, and so, but we do that. I mean, we honestly do that. You know, when we have no mind to be in church, we don't have no mind, but then there come to a time when things started really going wrong, and I had to step up and start praying. And when I realized that things was, you know, uh, my daughter seemed like maybe once a week I was getting a call. And I was like, man, how in the world do you get in trouble so much? And so here I, I, I'd say, okay, I'll be down to get you. We'll be picking you up. And it's either the jail house, courthouse, or somewhere. And... And I got to where I ended up having to pray for her because I worried about her all the time. But sometimes God's got to put the little devils in our life <laughs> to get us to pray hard enough for them, or we ain't never going to get nowhere. And you know, and and then the Lord just blessed her because you know once I started really, really praying, God started bringing her out of the things that she was in, and and I wasn't getting them phone calls no more. But I didn't step back in praying. Because I realized God answered their prayers because, you know, a man, uh, 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 I think it was a, a judge, I don't remember who it was, that said, you know what, with all them tickets she's had, all the, all the driving on suspended, all that, she should have been in jail. But yet, not one time did she go to, you know, go to jail, I mean, just more than five, ten minutes. And most of the time, they let her off. They was like, okay, go on home, call your mom. And I've had two or three of them sit there and say, well, you call, I'll call your mom, and she can be here in just a little bit, then I'll let you go. That was only a God thing, because otherwise she should have been in jail. But God just blessed it that she was not going to jail, and, and all the wrecks she had, oh my goodness. She was, she wrecked a car more than anybody. He gave her this car uh, for her, I think it was 16th birthday, and she wrecked it all the time. I mean, it, it was, they called it the Murph dirt. And, and it hit dirt more than it did on the, and because her, I don't know, the girl just always ended up in a ditch, on the side of the road, through a cornfield, through a field, in the middle of a field. I don't know how she even got into these things because it was just a little bitty old car. And, and yet, the Hilo said, third time she wrecked, he goes, I'm not fixing it no more. That's it. He goes, that is, that's it. I'm done with it. So then she had to find her own vehicle. And so then she got another vehicle and met this crazy dude that didn't know how to change a tire or change oil or anything else. And he finally blew it up for her because he little taught Mary how to do all that. And she would do it. And so then when she let her boyfriend drive, I guess she thought guys should just know this thing. Well, there's a lot of guys out there that don't know how to do nothing. And so he did not know how to do nothing. And when the check engine light come on, he just kept driving. And so he calls her and he says, check engine lights on, and she's like, well, you need to pull over and check it and see if there's water in it. Where? She's like, uh, well, <laughs> and she tried to explain to her, and I'm mad because I'm listening to this conversation, and it's her car, and I was like, oh my goodness, and so then she, he called her one time, and he's like, I have a flat, 
And she's like, well, change it. And he's like, well, I'm almost virgin, uh, virgins. And he, she's like, just get out and change it. And he goes, I never change a flat. How do I do that? She's like, I need a ride. So she gets a ride with one of her friends and goes and shows him how to change a tire. And I'm like, you know, but that was just, you know, you had to pray for this girl. I mean, because if her boyfriend wasn't flipping cars, she was flipping the cars. So I was like, man, what in the world, God? And so that started teaching me how to pray. Because when you end up with somebody that, that just constantly comes find something, you know, it's just like, Lord, what in the world is going on? So you learn to pray. And I meant really learn how to pray. And so I remember one time going to Kentucky. And, we, and Mary was driving. And we was, we was driving. We was going to a youth camp. And here we was just taking off. And I don't know how fast Mary was going. And a cop passed us. And then we seen the brake lights. And Mary goes, pray, Mom. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. And she's like trying to put her seatbelt on. And she's like, pray, Mom. And I'm like, come pray. And he's, she's like, no, Mom, you need to learn how to pray like Grandma. <laughs> and that, that will put you in your place right there when your kid tells you, you need to learn how to pray like Grandma. Because Mom knew how to pray. When she started praying, you knew God was moving because she would just start speaking in tongues and God was there. But I was like, Jesus, help us, Lord. Don't let that cop stop us, you know. And, you know, she's like, pray like Grandma. You know, it's like she was getting all upset because my mom knew how to pray. And, uh, but, you know, God just blessed him, and he went on. He, his brake lights went off and on and he went. And so she's like, you really need to learn how to pray like Grandma. <laughs> but, you know, when your kids tell you that, then it makes you think, you know, where, where have I been? What, what am I doing that I can't touch God the way I need to be? when we are in a situation where God needs to be called in touch, you know, because, you know, I, I don't understand how people can go every day without God. I don't understand how people can just continue every day through their lives doing whatever they want. You know, I, I watch uh, some of my family on, on Facebook, and they're just like out in the middle of the moon. They're laughing about the drinking. They're laughing about this, that day. And, and, and it, it hurts me because I'm thinking... What are they thinking? You know, why, why are they doing that stuff for? Why, look at them now. Look at their life. Do they think they're really happy? Their, their life is totally messed up. And they have nothing, nothing to call their own. They, they're just, it seems like they're just in a little box. And they're staying in that box. And they think they're having fun. And they're not. And nothing that they do like that is even fun. Driving, you know, it, it shows them driving with beers in their hand, that's not fun. I've seen them wreck. I've seen, I've seen accidents. I've seen my nephew. He can't walk, and I'm thinking, why are you guys still doing this? Why are you still out there acting like you're an idiot? Because you think it's funny how many friends you have, and I'll lose my friends if I turn around and 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 act like I should. Well, that that ain't even right because I'm thinking, mom prayed so long for these kids. Mom prayed so hard for them, for them just to. Ignore that God is even there until they really, really need Him. And then they wonder what in the world's going on. And it, it hurts. It hurts when you see your kids out. I remember sister praying for Leah all the time, saying, God, help her, you know. And she said, I believe in Leah's coming in. And, and you, you look at him and you're thinking, man, when is that ever going to happen? But then God reminds me, there was a time that Kevin was out there. And I was like, he ain't never going to come in. And I was getting so mad at him because he'd be out there on the boat and just acting like God wasn't even there. And I was thinking, what in the world? And, and, and I would see, you know, Becky knows these, these kids would seem like they would be out in La La Land. And I was thinking, what in the world? We've always got an excuse to stay home. And when our family needs us, and we need them so much to be in church in the last days, and yet we're not even here for church for ourselves. How can we expect us to be praying for our kids if we can't be here where we belong? If we can't get what we're... They are watching our lives. If they look at us, you know, um, a young lady told me, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago, and she goes, she was talking about, I don't believe God gives, uh, has moved on me about wearing the pants, the makeup, the the cutting the hair and all that stuff. She said, I don't see everything that you guys see. And I said, maybe not, but God will show you when it's time. But I said, if God shows you and you get hardened and not do it, then it's on your, 
on you. I said, because sometimes God will deal with us and we don't listen. We'll go ahead and, and live like the world and act like the world. But I said, honey, what if you ever seen me at Walmart? And I said, I had a pair of pants on. What would you think? She said, I would love you anyway. And I was like, really? And I said, so I'm going to go to Walmart tomorrow with a pair of pants. And she goes, you would not. <laughs> and I was like, okay, then why do you think it's? She goes, well, you're different. No, I'm not. I am not different. If you think it's wrong for somebody else to do it, and you see somebody out there in church and all their life, and you look and it just hurts you, and that, and you're thinking, man, what in the world are they doing acting like that? Because everybody sees you. God sees you. And me, why not judge you? And I don't, I mean, you know, I, I was like the young lady that, you know, I see her every time I see her and she's wearing pants. It don't bother me. I am not God. Right. I am not the one to judge her. But I am not going to wear that because I feel very convicted of it. And that's the way I was raised. I was raised totally different than that. But when I see people out that claims to be God, that, that they have God and they know they were once Pentecostal and they once knew what God had told them not to do this and not to do that. And I've heard them even say it. And then you see them out there wearing what they said that they would never wear. A young lady told me one time, she said, well, I don't believe, uh, she was used to tell me all the time, I believe in, you know, you got to look right, act right, and she's always telling me all this stuff. And then when she met this guy, she decided that she was just going to live like him. And then it was totally a different story. And so I come up to her and I said, so how you doing? And I, that's all I said. And she's like, don't be judging me. And I was like, whoa. I was like, honey, I just said, how are you doing? And she said, yeah, but I was waiting on it. And I was like, waiting on what? She said, you tell me about me wearing pants and stuff. And I said, honey, I don't have to tell you if you already feel that bad about it and you already feel convicted and you think I'm going to say something, then you better go home and change. Wow. And she said, see, you are judging me. I said, no, you just judged yourself. And I yeah. walked off because I did not say a word to her. She was one of, I mean, all I did, I didn't look at her outfit or nothing. I just looked at her face and asked her how she did. And she just went off. But then she knew. And now she's back in church. But, you know, I just, it, it just, Think of all the excuses we can make of a man, a woman, oh, they're not in church, so why should I go? Uh, they're not loving right, so what? And that was my worst thing when I was in church. When I first got in, I was like, well, I don't really have to do that because look at them. They're in church and they're doing whatever they want. And they're up on the platform, so why? There ain't nothing. I'm fine. I don't really have to pray because they're, they're there and I'm fine. And I used to say that all the time. I mean, I, that was just an excuse. Because I didn't want to be a pillar. I didn't want to be a doorkeeper. I didn't want to be the person to come in and clean the truck. I didn't want to be responsible for nothing. So if I can make an excuse, why not to sit there and pray? That was my excuse. Well, look at them. They're, you know, they don't, they don't have to do it, so why should I do it? And it was always something. But if we really, really want to be a pillar in the church, and we want to do something for God... We'll look around and say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And God, I'll be willing to be there. And and sometimes, you know, like today, I just I just felt so bad. And I was like, man, I, I don't know if I should go or not. And hello, this is me. And I'm just saying I'm not going to go to church. For five seconds, I thought of that. And then I'm thinking, Sonia, you're going to go to church because that's what you was raised. You was raised to go to church, sick or not. And God would heal you there. And, and, you know, if I can't depend on God to be there and meet me at the church, then I might as well stay home because I have no faith at all. And I'm not saying that you can't, you know, you can't be sick or anything. But I'm saying that I, the way I was raised, I know if I make it to church that God's going to meet me there. And like now, I mean, at first I just, I felt so sick and I had to fight it and just say, Jesus, help me. And the more... I got up here, the more I start pushing, and it's like my head start, the devil's trying to, and I was like, no. I, you know, I, God gave me here for a reason, I even told him, I said, I, when next time Brother Mark calls me and asks me to minister, I said, I'm going to say no. I said, because one thing, I'm getting sick, because I, I've, I've got to be up here, and the next thing is, i got a headache, and I'm really nervous. <coughs> and so, <laughs> this is my excuse. And so, but then, you know, I, it comes back to what would I if if everybody was like me? What would we do? We would have nobody to help. And so I was thinking, you know, I just need to stand up and be what I need to be. And then 
You know, because I already ran out of that excuse that, you know, God didn't call a woman because of, of my mom. She always used to say, uh, you, oh man, that woman could minister. But people would put her down so much. I might put her down so much. And so that was a good excuse for me. It's like, uh, well, God never called no woman to minister, so.